we'll be talking about the current evidence based concepts in the management of severe traumatic brain injury now when we talk about severe traumatic brain injury that means a glasgow coma scale of 8 or less now severity of traumatic brain injury is based on glasgow coma scale if the uh, gcs is less than 8 it is severe if it's 9 to 12 it is uh, moderate if it is 13 to 15 it is mild now what we'll talk about is based on the BTF guidelines which were published in 2016 and they were based on evidence based guidelines. The 18 points that will be discussed in BTF guidelines are decompressive craniectomy, prophylactic hypothermia, hyperosmolar therapy, CSF drainage ventilation therapy, anesthetics, steroids, nutrition, prophylaxis of infection or DVT, seizure prophylaxis, ICP, CPP, ACP uh, advanced monitoring and thresholds of BP, ICP, CPP and advanced cerebral monitoring thresholds now this is based on the uh, various studies they were divided into class 1 class 2 and class 3 studies class 1 studies included prospective rcts class 2 studied included non-randomized prospective controlled trials and class 3 included cohort studies retrospective or prospective it is important to know that descriptive studies case studies case series and expert opinions were excluded and they were not included in the BTF 4 guidelines. Based on all these studies, they had three levels, level 1, level 2, level 3, uh, level of recommendation. Level 1 was based on high quality body of uh, evidence, 2A was based on moderate and 2B and 3 was based on low quality body of evidence. Decompressive craniectomy will be discussing four points decompressive versus the medical management, decompressive craniectomy of various sizes, and decompressive craniectomy versus craniotomy, along with the timing of decompressive craniectomy. There is no level 1 evidence in decompressive craniectomy. The level 2 evidence is based on the DECRA trial, which says that bifrontal decompressive craniectomy is not recommended to improve the Glasgow outcome scale, extended scale, at 6 months. In patients with severe traumatic brain injury, with diffuse injury without mass lesion, with ICP elevation of more than 20 mm of mercury for more than 15 minutes. And it is important to know that it included patients that were refractory to first line therapy and it included decompressive craniectomy as an early neuroprotective source. Large frontotemporal decompressive craniectomy not less than 12 cm into 15 cm is recommended. Now coming to the various trials, we will talk about the trials which included secondary decompressive craniectomy. Uh, they were the DECRA trial and the rescue ICP trial. De in the DECRA trial, uh, Decompressive craniectomy was used in early neuroprotective therapy and it proved that decompressive craniectomy is harmful than the medical management although there was a lot of selection bias and the post hoc analysis of DECRA trial showed that there was no significant difference between the two groups and the delirious effect of uh, decompressive craniectomy was negated in the post hoc analysis. When we talk about the rescue ICP trial it includes uh, Decompressive craniectomy is last tire resort or the rescue therapy and it showed the importance of decompressive craniectomy as the last tire resort. It includes patient with ICP more than 25 mm of mercury for more than 60 minutes. In primary decompressive craniectomy, there is an undergoing trial which is known as rescue acutaceous trial. Now these are the results based on the uh, rescue ICP trial. These are the Glasgow outcome scale 6 months results. And it showed that decompressive craniectomy for severe and refractory intracranial hypertension after TBI resulted in 22% lesser mortality as compared to the medical management alone. And there were increased patients in vegetative state, lower severe disability, upper severe disability than the medical management. It is also important to know that there were increased amount of patients in the upper severe disability group which means that there were more patients who were independent at home. So decompressive craniectomy not only resulted in increased amount of patients in the vegetative state rather they also increased the number of patients who became independent at home thus proving the importance of decompressive craniectomy as the last tire resort 
in cases of ref medically refractory raised intracranial tension after traumatic brain injury. Now coming to the next point, prophylactic hypothermia. The role of hypothermia versus normothermia, shorter versus longer uh, duration of cooling, head only versus systemic cooling. So there is no level 1 or level 2A evidence to support uh, hypothermia and there is level 2B evidence that early or short term prophylactic hypothermia is not recommended to improve outcomes in patients with diffuse injury although there have been many conflicting uh, reports but the current evidence suggests that hypothermia is not recommended and the probable reasons for that is coagulopathy, immunosuppression, cardiac arrhythmias and rebound raised intracranial pressure. There are many pilot studies going on uh, on localized cerebral cooling but the results of those studies are inconclusive and no evidence can be based on that. Coming to hyperosmolotherapy, although the hyperosmolotherapy lowers the intracranial pressure, there is insufficient evidence about the effects on clinical outcomes to support a specific recommendation or to support the use of any specific hyperosmolar agent for patients with severe traumatic brain injury. Now there have been recommendations which have been carried forward from the previous third edition regarding the hyperosmolar therapy and those recommendations are Manitol is effective for control of raised intracranial pressure at doses 0.25 gram per kg to 1 gram per kg body weight Arterial hypotension that is systolic BP of less than 90 mm of mercury should be avoided Restrict Manitol use prior to ICP monitoring to patients with signs of transtentorial herniation or progressive neurological deterioration not attributable to extracranial causes. Now there have been many studies regarding which high, uh, hyperosmolar agent to be used, uh, whether hypertonic saline must be used or mannitol, but there is no conclusive evidence. Now, coming to the next point of cerebrospinal fluid drainage, whether drainage should be continuous or intermittent or whether it is associated with lower mortality. There is no level 1 or level 2 evidence uh, based, uh, on this topic. There is a level 3 evidence that EVD system zeroed at the midbrain with continuous drainage or CSF may be considered to lower ICP burden more effective than the intermittent use. So continuous uh, ICP uh, EVD is better than intermittent CSF drainage by EVD and use of CSF drainage to lower the ICP in patients with GCS less than 6 during the first 12 hours after injury is recommended. Now in the ventilation therapy there is no level 1 or level 2 A evidence and there is a level 2 B evidence that PaCO2 should not be less than 25 mm of mercury. Now PaCO2 uh, if it is less than 25 mm of mercury can lead to cerebral uh, vasoconstriction which can lead to severe cerebral ischemia so it is not at all recommended to undergo PaCO2 less than 25 and the recommendations which are carried from the third edition say that hyperventilation is recommended as a temporary measure only to lower the intracranial pressure and hyperventilation should not be used in the first 24 hours after injury because during that time the CBF or the cerebral blood flow is critically reduced and if the hyperventilation is used it is better to use SJVO2 monitoring. There have been many studies regarding hyperventilation with TAM but the results are inconclusive. The hypothesis is that it acts as a buffer and prevents CSF acidosis. But there is no evidence uh, strong enough to suggest the role of TAM. Now coming to anesthetics, analgesics and sedatives. It is important to know that there is a level 2B evidence that barbiturate should not be used as prophylaxis. They should be used to control ICP which is refractory to other medical management, tier 1 and tier 2 management. And propofol, although it is recommended to lower the ICP, it is not recommended for improvement in mortality or 6 month outcomes. And when we are giving propofol, we have to be wary of the propofol infusion syndrome. Now this is the protocol for the barbiturate coma induction. Uh, you can learn it if required there is no need to read it out it is just for educational purpose now if propofol is used it is very important to know about the side effects of propofol especially the propofol infusion syndrome in which there is hyperkalemia hepatomegaly lipemia metabolic acidosis myocardial failure 
rhabdomyolysis and renal failure. An extreme caution must be taken when the dose is greater than 5 mg per kg per hour or when the dose exceeds more than 48 hours. Now steroids, it's very important. It's the only level 1 evidence in BTF guidelines which was based on the crash trial. The study was halted after 62 months prior to reaching full enrollment because the interim analysis showed clear, clear delirious effects of steroids on survival. So the, role, uh, the steroids are not at all recommended and in patients with uh, traumatic brain injury, high dose methylprid is associated with increased mortality and it is strictly contraindicated. It is important to remember that it's the only level 1 guideline. Now coming to nutrition, timing of feeding after injury, method of feeding, glycemic control, vitamins and supplements. So there is level 2 evidence that uh, feeding is recommended at least by day 5 and at most by day 7 post injury to decrease the mortality. There is level 2B evidence that transgastric jejunal feeding is recommended to reduce the incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia. It is also important to remember that in cases of head injury, tight glycemic control is not required. Now coming to inf infection prophylaxis, inf uh, prevention of VAP and EBD prophylaxis, there is level 2A evidence <coughs> that early tracheostomy is recommended to reduce mechanical ventilation. The role of povidine iodine or the betadine oral care is not recommended to reduce VAP rather it can be harmful so povidine iodine oral care may increase the risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome there is also level 3 evidence that antimicrobial impreg impregnated catheters may be considered to prevent catheter related infections during placement of exter uh, external ventricular drainage very procedural antibiotics for intubation should be administered to reduce the incidence of pneumonia is no longer recommended when we are inserting EVD or shunts, it is important to do uh, periprocedural antibiotics only and if there is CSF leak, there is no role of any prophylactic antibiotic use. Uh, it is also important to know that after discussing the use of prolonged antimicrobial prophylaxis in patients with EVD with several neurosurgeons, it seems apparent that the culture of using antibiotics for extended periods of time for EVD prophylaxis is ingrained in their training and it would be very difficult to change this practice although there is no evidence to suggest the role of antibiotics throughout the duration of EVD and only periprocedural antibiotic is recommended still it is ingrained deeply in the training and it is very difficult to change this trend. <coughs> Now coming to DBT prophylaxis, low molecular weight heparin like enoxaparin or low dose unfractionated heparin may be used in combination with me mechanical prophylaxis. However, there is increased risk of expansion of intracranial hemorrhage. In addition to compression stockings, pharmacological prophylaxis may be considered if the brain injury is stable and the benefit is considered to outweigh the risk associated with intracranial hemorrhage. There is insufficient evidence to re support recommendation regarding preferred agent, preferred dose or the timing of pharmacological prophylaxis for DVT. Now coming to Caesar prophylaxis. Now Caesar prophylaxis, Caesar in the post traumatic cases can be immediate which is within 24 hours, early which is less than 7 days or late which is more than 7 days. Now risk factors for early post traumatic seizures are GCS of 10 or less, post traumatic amnesia lasting longer than 30 minutes, linear or depressed skull fracture penetrating head injury, subdural epidural intracerebral hematoma or cortical contagion, age less than equal to 65 years or chronic alcoholism. So these are the risk factors for early post-traumatic seizures that is within 7 days. Now coming to the recommendation, the prophylactic use of phenytoin or valproate is not recommended for preventing late post-traumatic seizures and phenytoin is recommended to decrease the incidence of early post-traumatic seizures that is within 7 days of injury where the overall benefit is felt to outweigh the complications which are associated with the treatment of phenytoin. However, early post-traumatic seizures have not been associated with worse outcomes. 
At the present time, there is insufficient evidence to recommend levetiracetam over phenytoin regarding efficacy in preventing early post-traumatic seizures and its toxicity. Now, coming to the risk factors of post-traumatic epilepsy or the late post-traumatic seizures, <coughs> the risk factors are severe traumatic brain injury, early post-traumatic injury prior to discharge, acute intracerebral hematoma or cortical contagion, post-traumatic amnesia lasting more than 24 hours, age more than 65 years, a pre-morbid history of depression. The drug of choice, although there is insufficient evidence, is levetiracetam in case of post-traumatic epilepsy. Now, coming to ICP monitoring, ICP monitoring, there is level to be evidence that management of severe traumatic brain injury using information from ICP monitoring is recommended to reduce the hospital and two-week post-injury mortality and treating ICP, which is more than 22 millimeter of mercury, is recommended. There is level 3 evidence that combination of ICP values along with the clinical and brain CT findings may be used to make management protocols. And the uh, recommendations which are carried from third edition are that if there is any case with severe traumatic brain injury that is GCS of 8 or less with abnormal CT scan then ICP monitoring should be done. But if there is traumatic brain injury with a normal CT scan then ICP monitoring has to be done only if two or more of these three things are valid. That is the age is more than 40 years. If there is unilateral or bilateral motor posturing or if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeter of mercury. Now coming to CPP monitoring, there is level to be evidence that CPP monitoring reduces the two week mortality. And the target CPP that should be kept is 60 to 70 millimeter of mercury. It is also important to know that aggressive attempts to keep C CPP more than 70 millimeter of mercury with fluids and pressors should not be done because it increases the risk of adult respiratory failure. So the target of CPP is 60 to 70. The BP thresholds are more than 100 millimeter of mercury if uh, the age is 50 to 69 and it is more than 110 millimeter of mercury if the age is from 15 to 49 or 17 years or more. In the advanced cerebral monitoring, the various modalities are transcranial Doppler, duplex sonography, jugular venous oximetry or SGVO2, differences between arterial and jugular venous oxygen, brain oximetry, which can be invasive or non-invasive by NIRS, microdialysis and electrocorticography. The recommendation is that jugular venous saturation of less than 50% may be a threshold to avoid in order to reduce the mortality and improve the outcomes. Also, ju uh, jugular bulb monitoring of arteriovenous oxygen content difference as a source of information in management decisions may be considered to reduce the mortality and improve the 6 months and 3 months outcome. Now these are the various studies and the various trials, the rescue STH and the crash trials, stitch trials that you can go through. Thank you. That's all for this lecture.